place for the first season was weird. The devs weren't really sure what this thing they were doing was. The fanbase had maybe 100 people in it, and the main storylines and characters which are now part of the game's history would only really form in season 2. The first and most important baseball star to emerge from this hazy primordial soup was Jessica Telephone. Everyone loves Jessica Telephone, so did the baseball gods in the season 1 elections. They blessed her by maximizing her stats and making her the best player in the league, a 5 star when the average was maybe 3. She left the Dallas Stakes to join the Philadelphia Pies, who were fresh off an internet league baseball win. The league's greatest player joined its greatest team, and they absolutely dominated the season 2, bringing the Pies their second win. Jessica's popularity exploded. She got fan art, fan fiction, unnamed bat, made batting leaderboards, and when the Eddie Tiger saw her from the Pies, she promptly also led that team to victory. Jessica Telephone coasted from win to win, from victory to victory among hordes of adoring fans. Whenever she would score, they would go ring ring. And then there is her brother, Sebastian Telephone. It isn't easy being Sebastian Telephone. The way Braceball's lore making process works, the fans don't really, by the side, have much to build on as far as the characters go. And that was even more true in Season 1 when they only had names, starts, performance and some loose information to base their stories on. Someone noticed that two players had the same name in the same team and so the one or two stakes fans present in Season 1 were like, ok, well, I guess they're siblings or clones or married or something. I'm not joking about the one or two, by the way. The stakes have always been the smallest or second smallest team in baseball by fan base size. I'm not sure why. Perhaps the Houston Spice they call the Texans because their name and logo sound cooler. Perhaps there's a lot of vegetarians in the fan base. Maybe their color, a silvery gray, isn't as eye catching as that of other teams. I don't know. Whatever the cause, a small fan base in baseball's first 10 seasons almost always tracked with being a bad team. That's because elections favored teams with a lot of fans who can marshal a lot more votes. More votes meant better odds when drawing for blessings. So over a long enough period of time, big teams improved while smaller ones stagnated or worse. Again, there was a lot of randomness involved, so this wasn't always true. But most of the time, it tracked. Point is, the stakes have always been good, but not great. And due to the way elections worked, over time their performance has just gotten worse. They've never won an IRB title, never made it out of the first round of playoffs despite appearing in them in 7 out of the 10 seasons of the discipline era. It's a self-reinforcing group. Strong teams attract more fans, and the more fans a team has, the stronger it gets. But because of that, if Jessica had remained with the stakes, we may speak of them now as we speak of the pies or tigers or crabs. For that matter, the simulation randomly chose her. It could have been Seb with just a slightly different outcome from drawing a series of 14 random numbers, the whole history of baseball would have been different. The roles would have been reversed, and Jess would have been left to stagnate with the stakes while Seb thrived. But the simulation decided otherwise. Sebastian Telephone has always been a good hitter. A pretty good hitter. I don't think he ever made any leaderboards, but he more than carried his weight. The Stakes had a good season 1, an exceptional season 2, ending with a record of 72 wins, the third highest in baseball history, then treaded water in season 3 until they started their inevitable decline. Seb was there to all of it, and what little fun after discussion of him there was, mostly focused on his connection to Jessica. Don't get me wrong, the Stakes, all 20 or 30 of them, loved him, but he was always in his sister's shadow. Never stuck out on his own. If I may read too much into the simulation, what could Jessica have said to Sebastian before leaving for the pies? That, well, it's the will of the gods, nothing to do about it. Or maybe that she's sure he will join her soon, perhaps that he's a big boy that he can get by without her. Or maybe that nothing good can ever be achieved without sacrifice, and that she's sure she will become a star with the pies. Besides, you know, they would still see each other when the frantic pace of baseball allowed for it. But imagine being Sebastian Telephone at the end of season 3. 
You are happy, for sure, about your sister's success. She has become the star she was always meant to be. And your team is okay, good, even if you never make it past round one of playoffs. By all measures of it, you are a successful player. Maybe you envy Jesse a little bit, maybe you do want adoring fans into IAB titles on your belt, or maybe you're just at peace with it. As season 4 goes on and she switches back again to the Paris, maybe you start to think that the point isn't really to be famous or the best. Maybe it's just about being there for each other and for your team and for the fans, be they Five Dads Grilling or the Regions of Stance Jessica's. And then you switched with an alternate version of yourself for another reality, because this is baseball. In season 4, the community could vote on a decree, a particular thing which greatly affected the game in its entirety, unlike pressings who usually affect only a team, player or league. Also unlike pressings, they aren't assigned semi-randomly, with the team with the most votes getting the best odds. It's a simple majority, the most votes wins. The choices were, buff, the bottom 4 teams, nerf, the top 4 teams, nerf, the top team, or fuck shit up. The fans chose to fuck shit up and the the top 4 teams, but that doesn't matter right now. Point is, Sebastian's stats were randomized by, according to a game's lore, switching him with another version of himself. Those were Seb's stats before, and those were his stats after. Not much changed, not even the cold hand of sarcastic randomness could stop him from being aggressively above average. I like to think this version of Sebastian was almost imperceptibly different from the regular one. Perhaps this world had Bernstein beers instead of Bernstein. Perhaps you can visit the torch of the Statue of Liberty. Or maybe Eminem retired in 2003, thus solidifying his status as one of the greatest rappers ever. And this Sebastian preferred the T-Bone to Ribeye, who was left instead of right-handed, where a just slightly lighter shade of blue. But it's hard to think Jessica was not successful in this universe too, and Seb always in a shadow. Season 4 is when things start going wrong for both. Even if it isn't noticeable at first, the stakes are still holding on, Jessica is getting even better but she isn't enough to carry the Paris to another victory. In fact, in season 5 they collapse completely, netting the worst season to date. At the start of season 6, the Pinut God, one of the baseball gods, asked the fans to idolize three players whose names it had changed to Pinut related bands. Idolizing was a mechanic, introduced that same season that let people select one player as their idol and receive money every time they did things like eat homers, get strikeouts, and so on. There was also an idol board, with the topmost three spots cut off by what the game scored called an ominous red line. The fans quickly put two and two together and tried to get the peanuts to the top. It didn't work, and Jessica, who was the most well-liked player and an extremely good one to earn money with, easily ended up in the top three. The peanut was arranged and then crossed air within a giant peanut shell. Jessica became a victim of her fame, the same gods that made her a star in season 2 now punished her for being one. Imagine being Sebastian Telephone. You aren't sure how to feel, like she probably isn't dead, is she in suspended animation, in a coma, is she just there, you know, hanging out? Which of these is the more terrible option? Will you ever see her again? Either way, you don't know. You don't know. All you know is that you've got to shape up, get on the field, play the best you ever have. If, uh, when she comes out, she will be proud of her brother. So you polish your butt, tie your shoes, look out for a brand new day and get incinerated. Baseball is a horror game. There's a popular thread on the baseball subreddit which suggests a radical new rule to make baseball interesting again. Whenever a player strikes out, there's a small chance, about 1 in 40,000, that the umpire pulls out a gun and shoots him. The response was overwhelmingly positive, and baseball, showing just how superior it is to that other sport, works a bit like that. During Eclipse weather, which is usually the weather of about one-fourth or one-fifth of a regular season's games, there's a small chance an umpire will incinerate an active batter or pitcher. It only happens four or five times a season in normal circumstances, but baseball is never normal. In Season 7, the fans used the idol board to commit necromancy and revive incinerated player Jaren or Dog Fingers, but she came back with a curse. 
Every time you should hit a player with a pitch, they will be made a stable for 9 games. Unstable players are much more likely to be incinerated during Eclipse games. It's much worse than regular incinerations. You know the players are at risk, so you're just on edge, waiting to see if it will happen or not. Regular incinerations are sudden. You don't have time to imagine them, to dread them, which is the worst part. On day 65 of the seventh season of the Internet League Baseball, Jaren Otto fingers hit Sebastian Telephone with a pitch and made him a stable and made him unstable. On day 67, Sebastian Telephone was incinerated by a rogue empire under Brank Sun. See, that's not even the worst part. On day 63, under bird weather, a flock of birds packed Jessica Telephone free of her woody prison. The brightest minds of Bracebow's fanbase, the members of the Society for Internet Bracebow Research or Cyber, had long theorized that a shared prayer could be freed by birds. Birds is a type of weather that appeared alongside peanut weather and which shows random messages on the game log related to birds. One of them is the bird circle but don't find what they're looking for. The nerds thought it was related to shared prayers and they were right. Jessica Telephone burst out of her shell and instantly delivered the home run to the joy of her fans. All this happened four days before her brother's death. Four baseball days, so four hours in regular human time. Again, Time is weird in baseball, but let's assume it was four days as we understand them. So, did they call each other? Did they make friends for hanging out? Did Jessica learn that Seb was unstable and understand the implications? Instability had already killed earlier in the season. And what did she think or do when she learned he was dead? She was back on the field, still a top player, but something was missing. And then she gets shared again in the exact same way, because baseball fans never learn. That's it. That's the end of the Telephone Twins. Sebastian is ashes, Jessica once again trapped in her own golden prison. In Season 10, Day X, a selection of the league's dead players came back to life as the All Stars, a super team formed to fight the shared one's pods, that is, players stolen by the peanut god to fight on its behalf. Sebastian was on the former and Jessica on the latter. The two teams were, in a way, mirrors of each other. The peanut took all shared players and three it had previously marked for its team. That included the league's greatest stars and all but one of their limited tags as features because of reasons. Nagomi McDaniels, York Silk, and obviously Jessica Telephone were among them. The whole stars were also some of the league's greatest stars Randy Valens, Boyfriend Monreal, Workman Groom. The fans also decided who would be on board. By getting players shared by way of idolization, idolization for the pods, by making tributes in the Hall of Frame, a separate readerboard containing dead prayers for the stars. But while the pods were doing the bidding of a malevolent god who had trapped beloved prayers and stolen them from their team, the stars were what the league sent to destroy the Pinut and free them. The match between the stars and the pods was set up like a JRPG boss battle, with every action like hits, runs, home runs damaging the enemy. The Pinot floated above the game's interface and occasionally spoke, taunting the players. Whenever Jessica scored, it would go ring ring. Imagine being Sebastian Telephone and having to kill God to save your sister. You need to play well, better than you ever have. You are rubbing shoulders with some of the greatest baseball players ever and going against the same. You are so out of your depth, you don't even see the surface anymore. You've got to try, you've got to pray, you have to step onto the field under the gaze of a dark god, grab your bat, bend your legs slightly, ice on the ball, and get incinerated again. Sebastian Telephone is the only player in baseball history to have been incinerated twice. 
in a Q&A, the developers said that in their test runs, in a Q&A, the developers said that in their test runs, dozens of all star players died, but in the actual thing, I guess all odds, only one did. Finally, the simulation had chosen Sebastian. At the start of the match, the All Stars received a buff depending on how many tributes the fanbase had donated to that particular player, which increased their HP or team spirit. Quite literally, the fans' love for them was what kept them going. When Seb died, the player who replaced him, Scrap Murphy, added his own team spirit and that helped clinch it for the stars. Thanks to Seb's sacrifice, they won the match, killed the peanut and returned the players to the league. Sebastian Telefon had saved not only his sister, but all of baseball. It had only taken his life. Nothing good is ever achieved without a sacrifice. There's another layer to this. The players on the whole starts were released. It's a player modification that places them outside of the old baseball system. They aren't in the Hall of Frame, the underworld for baseball players. They are somewhere else. We don't know where, but we must imagine the map away from the relentless spray and incinerations and broad drains. Seb was incinerated, so he went right back to what might be considered hell, or limbo, or whatever. Necromancy has happened twice now in baseball. Seb not being released means he has a chance to unite with his sister. Again, you can't ever read too much into a simulation, and no one knows what the future holds. But you could say that paradise, or just freedom, a release, a happy ending, wasn't worth it for him if he had to leave her behind.